Hey everyone. We got our spring Q&A. It's what, June 1st? So it's barely, barely spring. It's cold out today, so we'll say it's still spring and not yet summer. And also because COVID-19, time doesn't exist. So gotcha, anyone trying to, trying to hook me on this one. Uh, we're trying something new tonight. We, we might, uh, you know, this video might look better because I'm gonna try a new camera. Maybe this is gonna work, maybe it's not. I happen to have someone here to read my questions because I didn't feel like putting on my glasses. I'm not trying that hard, but I will take any excuse I can get to spend extra time with you, my dearest beloved. We've been under the same roof now for how many months? Uh, it's cl It's gotta be close to, it's more than three months now. Um, what's today? March what 48th. March 48th? I don't God, know. May, May was it just, that year took forever. Um, it's been a while. So Normally yeah. we're traveling. Actually, and as we, of today, it's been more than three months. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we can't get enough of each other, fortunately. And now I get to have you for this. Thank you. <sighs> you are very welcome. All right, we have um, mm -hmm. many questions. We have like eight pages of questions, if not more, and we'll do our best. We will do our best. He bribed me with Rosé to be here. All right. Michael J. says... How do you sleep well, knowing how ridiculously easy it is to bypass so much common security? And not just when traveling, but also at home, parents, etc. How do you protect yourself and or other people in your immediate circle, given the sorry state of doors, locks, etc.? Especially when people generally don't give a hoot until shit hits the fan. Hello, Michael. Um, yeah, that's, that's a big one. That's a big question, right? The, the short answer, and the, the kind of answer that Everwest Security Pro gives you is, like, security is in layers. It's not one fail-safe. But you can't, like, go on Amazon and be like, I need to buy some layers. So, quick shit, right? Um, when I'm traveling, because you mentioned travel specifically, and even my relatives, like, family members' houses, we've equipped our relatives in various places with something like a door jam, a door... Not, a, not like a, a door wedge, but there's actually a product. It was... Remember the club, like the automotive tool, the club? They branched out and tried to make home security, and they had a product called the Door Club. And literally, yeah, it's like this brass bar that you drop down behind the door, and you have to drill a little hole in the floor. But it's pretty goddamn strong. So I've actually put that in uh, my parents' houses. Uh, they have a little cabin. They have, uh, you know, they have the house like that I grew up in. They have door clubs. Um, they have alarm systems, you know, electronic monitoring and electronic alarms if you're like us and you travel. We are, it's about response, right? Like if someone were to breach this property, which is not easy to do, um, I think other people have asked during this troubling times, like how would you fortify a home and we'll get to them. And I tried to put some videos out about that recently, like the locks I use. But yeah, having the idea of layers doesn't mean like a barrier and a barrier and a barrier. It means this technology solution and this security solution. And if that doesn't catch them, then this other angle over here does. Like, maybe you have attack animals in your house, as you just saw. And as it all comes down to, like, you know, we're both very, very uh, Second Amendment friendly in this home. Uh, so Gurns, Gurns make an appearance, and I recommend them as a, a fallback. But if you're, like, much in the same way that people are like, the Second Amendment's the only one we need. If, if that's the only one you think you need, you're fighting the last war. Uh, because there's much in the same way you have to fight for other rights, like freedom of speech and assembly and faith. Uh, you also have to, like, understand that the gun is the, when everything else literally has hit the fan. And I gave a whole talk at DEF CON years ago. Mm -hmm. um, Christ, what was it called? It was called Boomstick Foo. Uh, it's on my site. So it's linked in the firearm section of my website. Like, Noid was on the panel. Uh, Mouse was on the panel. Thorn. Mm -hmm. Um, jurist. Uh, so we had like, you know, an ex-cop, a lawyer, a, a woman's perspective. It was, it was quite the, the magic tapestry. Major Malfunction was on one version of that because he's from the UK. Right. So all different gun voices. I somehow totally missed that one when I was busy super stalking you. I mean, OSINTing you while we were dating. It was really old. <laughs> I don't talk that far. Okay. It's a good talk though. It's pretty fun. <laughs> okay. JD is a mechanical engineering student and he says, I hope you are well. Thank you. I am well. Um, not everyone is, and we are very, we are very fortunate and privileged to, like, have a roof over our heads and you know doing okay. I hope you're well. Hmm. Uh, he says I was thinking. Well, actually, I don't know who JD is. So they say uh, I was thinking about using my resources to make non-metal keys. 
I know 3D printed keys have already been made with limited success, but I really want to create more daily use capable keys. Is carbon fiber, Delrin, or G10 a good choice of material? Should I give up on the non-metal idea and just focus on other metals like titanium, copper, aluminum, Damascus, etc.? Thank you so much for your time reading this question. Your con talks really brought me into the security world and gave me some fun party tricks, like breaking into my friend's apartment with a piece of paper the other day. I love that part of the question. <laughs> uh, that's actually the most sensible part of the question of just saying, oh, I did some fun stuff and got into my friend's apartment. That's awesome. Believe me when I say you are overthinking the other part of the question. Uh, you rattled off an amazing list of materials, both metallic and non-metallic, and the idea of making keys. But here, here's the real thing. I think you opened it up by saying, I, I can you know, rapidly make keys. You obviously have some experience in different materials. Maybe even you're a 3D printer. But you're like, I want to have a more robust key, one that can be more for kind of daily use. And I'm like, bro, I'm reading, I had to reread this twice. I'm like, where's fucking brass? Why is brass, like brass, dude? Keys are mostly made of brass. And there's a reason for it. It's super easy to machine and it holds up. So, oh my God. Like, don't overthink it, don't over-engineer it, just make brass. Well, he says non-metal keys. Well, he, he says, do I want non-metal or metal? But oh. specifically, if, if you're if somehow, like, non-metal is, like, a thing, um, you could print you could print in Teflon. Um, you could, yeah. yeah, you can print in Teflon cool. or car carbon fiber, you can print. Um, I wouldn't go, like, PLA or PETG, uh, even PLA+. Plus. I think Teflon is the most one of the most dimensionally stable kind of filaments that you can use. And that's, yeah, that, that one is a good option if that's what you're going for. But, dude, if you, if you have the ability to, like, just mill some blanks, which there are machines for this, right? There's the Easy Entry. There's the Keyway King or the Key King. The Keyway King. Uh, there's the, the Wuxin, like, Chinese kind of Keyway King, um, which you can also kind of, like, just, you can make a blank. And then if you've got the original key or at least the bidding for it, then it's just throwing that thing in a key machine or using a file. So by God, try to use brass whenever you can. That's what we do. <clears throat> Gabriel A. says, You had mentioned that you have an RFID implant. I also have an XEM. I was curious if you have any others and if you have found any more practical uses for, us, for it. Also, rum recommendations? Ha <laughs> ha! Um, yes, uh, I do. In fact, every... Every living thing in this room has at least one, if not more, uh, RFID implants, as it turns out. Because, yeah. You're right. Francis and Whisper have, okay. uh, have their chips. Yeah, uh, they, they have do. the Home Again chips. Uh -huh. uh, Tara and I both have uh, in each hand, in between mm -hmm. our metacarpals, we each have injectables. Uh, you said you have an XEM. We each have one of those. Yours mm -hmm. is in your left hand. Uh, this uh, is the... Yeah, yeah, and mine is in my right. Mm -hmm. uh, in our other hands... NFC. You have an NFC. She has an NFC. It's an NTAG 216 chip. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have the sort of Chinese magic backdoored MyFair emulated S50. Um, so I, yes, I use them all the time. I think that's really cool. Was the question like what practical uses there are or is there any better one to get? What was the question specifically there? Uh, you mentioned that you have an RFID implant and what he wanted to know if you have any others and if you have found any more practical uses for it. Either more practical uses for it or more practical uses hmm. for it. I'm not sure how the emphasis works on that one, yeah. but I think both are probably valid questions. I can say this. Uh, <laughs> Party the, trick here. <laughs> the plan is, I think this video, I said we're going to release this video that you're watching on June 1st. And if I'm remembering my cue, um, I think the next week's video is actually about an RFID-based padlock. And the implant hmm. does show up in that case. But yeah, for the most part... Um, in addition to storing fun little bits of data in her NTAG chip, uh, we use our low frequency ones kind of more than you'd think. Either if we're just curious, uh, and anytime we, they're usually set to something hid prox, mm -hmm. either a company that I was just breaking into or one of our offices where we, we've had credentials in our hands, but usually they're hid prox. And if you're ever in an environment where there's like a multi-class reader on the wall, or even just a reader that you're not sure of, you're like, I don't know what, what technology is that? One of us will invariably be like, beep. Well, I don't know who makes it, but it's fucking running prox. Mm -hmm. So we do that just to kind of test life as we're walking around in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, rum recommendations. Don't forget. Oh, yes, rum yes. I got three for you. We're going to go beep, beep, bop. So going to find it in most stores, mm -hmm. Total Wine, um, BevMo, etc. Zacapa. Zacapa is a pretty nice 
solid rum. It is, it's not like frat house, Captain Morgan kind of horse shit. So Zacapa is going to be, and it's, Zacapa makes some, some different expressions that are older and older, right? They, 23 is the one I... Yeah, the Zacapa 23 we like. Uh, if you can find Diplomatico, I've never really found a bad bottle of Diplomatico, but when we are traveling out of Washington State and find some tax breaks, we will usually try to bring home um, the Dictador, the, the Dictador 20. 20 years, the Solera Reserve. And that's probably my favorite rum. That appeared in that video where I mixed a little bit of that with the rum cask rye. Um, I didn't remember if we had a name for it or not. But I didn't see the Solera Reserve on it. This is the, the Dictador 20 is some, a Solera Reserve? It is. Huh. I mean, I can check. There, no, we finished it. I can't check. Sorry. We did finish it, didn't we? Yeah. yeah. All right. Quarantine. Damn. <laughs> Uh, Joe HK from Norway, and they say, would you recommend people wait for the technology to mature further before getting implanted with an RFID chip in their hands, or is the technology mature enough? That is another fabulous question, and this touches on, I, mean, I keep like pitching this RFID stuff like right down the road, which gets to the idea of, is it ready now or not? Um, so Cooper, who does a lot of the injections at the Biohacking Village, and my buddy Max and I, uh, all of whom we, we work in this space, We've had a talk kind of in the can for a while. It was supposed to be at B-Sides Orlando this year. That would have been in April if that had happened, maybe. B-Sides Orlando? I don't remember. It was it was supposed to be B-Sides Orlando, and then we said, oh, that got canceled. Maybe we'll do it at DEF CON. It was supposed to be in April. Yeah, That's and right. Jeff and I were like, oh, maybe you guys can do that at DEF CON. That'll be awesome. And then DEF CON got freaking canceled. So who the hell knows when this talk's going to show up? But there is there is an argument to be made for certain technologies are maybe going to mature more. However, the low frequency chip, the XEM that, um, you know, was it JD? No, Gabriel. Uh, Gabriel mentioned that he has. Low frequency is not changing. The XEM is a T5577. It's never going away. It's never going to change. It's always going to be what it is uh, because no one is developing low frequency chips anymore. So get an XEM like right now and you can do a lot of fun shit with it in my opinion. If you are wondering about the high frequency side so the ntag 216 the one that tara has that will do pretty much everything that nfc can do but it doesn't have as much memory as certain new chips coming out it doesn't have quite the same cryptological functions uh the vivo key the vivo key spark is coming out which is a type 4 or type 5 type 4 nfc uh and it has like it's a fips compliant algorithm on the chip it does a lot more in terms of storing the data securely if you want to get into crazy crypto things. And there's an infrastructure that that VivoKey is, is building around this chip. The idea of working with payment processing merchants and things, mm -hmm. like merchant banks that will use this as like that as a payment solution tied to your credit card. That's not there yet, but if you Google VivoKey and you see what they're doing, um, the Apex project and such, like it's... It's right on the horizon. So maybe you wait on the high frequency side, but definitely shove one of the low frequency ones in you. They're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. All right. Adeline T. Hi, Deviant. Thank you very much for all the great content on your channel, website, tool, and this Q&A. I am a PhD student at the University of Toronto. I'm so sorry. I know you're, I know you're pain. <sighs> not Toronto. We like TDOT. Oh, we, we, love, we love Toronto. It's just, I feel grad school life. I do. I discover you with your elevator talks and the you're probably not red teaming talk, and I have loved your content ever since. Aw, thank you. How do you deal with different jurisdictions? Ooh, this is a good question. Mm. Do you have to have a locksmith license for physical pen testing in North America or Europe? Huh. In Japan, the mere possession of lockpicks is considered mm -hmm. prima facie, for instance. This is especially con uh, concerning with what happened to the coal fire guys. If you had pen testing engagements in Europe, did you find that security or locks were on average higher, lower, or is it simply not comparable? So the first part of the question, any licenses and, and so forth, effectively no. Uh, many of us in core hold certain locksmithing licenses like, yes, um, Bobak has a locksmithing license, I'm a safe technician, so Aloha, Savta, a lot of law enforcement credentials that Rob had back when he was on the job are still semi-active. Uh, for his certifications, like I don't think we've ever needed to use OC or baton on a job, but like he's still certified in that. Uh, but the idea of what could go wrong on a job if you don't have certain credentials, I'm not familiar with anyone in the industry where that's been a thing. Uh, and frankly, even the coal fire situation, which by the way, we're if you don't know this, like we're all friends with those cats. 
Uh, they like they come to class with us. They work with us. We we work with them. Uh, I was one of the first people who like signaled Gary that night. I'm like, dude, what the fuck? He's like, oh my god, it's shit. This is bad. It's a pain in the ass. Uh, but none of like none of that situation would have been better if they had mm -hmm. credentials of any kind. What would have made that situation better was better communication between the project manager who who kind of was working the job and the sales team who sold the job and making sure the client really had the sign-off authority that the client said they did. And that's really hard. I'm not poo-pooing the coal fire management team. Like, projects come in and a job is a job and it's a freaking government agency and they're, you know, you're you getting... You think they know what they're doing. You think they know what they're doing, but it's the government, so they don't know what they're doing. So that wouldn't have um, saved them. Mm -hmm. Would I be worried working overseas? No, but it comes down more to privilege and preparation than it does to credentials. Uh, we've done work in dodgy countries, but it's because like someone with a lot of wasta in those countries was calling the shots, and you know that they have the pull. And, and once their name, you you bring up their name, and it, any local authority is going to be like, oh, you're working with that that person. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, which is not a nice way for the world to work, but it's the way the world works. Uh, one of the questions that Adeline had was, can you talk more about the distinction between surreptitious, covert, and overt entry? Yeah. So overt, covert, surreptitious. It all comes down to who will recognize there is a problem. Uh, if I use a crowbar to get in someone's door, it's likely that anybody could recognize that happened. Someone with no special training who wasn't particularly looking for a problem would be like, oh, shit. That's a problem. I'm a, I'd only stayed at a Holiday Inn last night, but I know that's wrong. That's overt entry. Covert entry, let's say lock picking, would mean that someone with no special training who's not specifically looking for evidence of an intrusion probably wouldn't see it. And as you know, with lock picking, like if you pick a lock successfully and you get in the door and close it up again, even bumping, bumping's right on the edge. If you bump once or twice, you might leave a little bit of a dent right in the edge of the keyway, right on that face. But someone with no special training is not really looking for that. And if the lock functions the next day, I mean, they're probably not going to notice. But someone with specialized training and knowledge, someone who is specifically looking for that evidence, will absolutely be able to uncover that evidence. There are tool marks, there are scratches, there are things out of place. And this applies to certain electronic attacks. When we um, put an ESP key like on access control wires, those wires get little bite marks on them. Right, And someone who is a trained technician, if they pull the card reader and they pull the pigtail out of the wall, they're like, that's not fucking right. And even what we do on jobs is we will usually cut the wires and re-terminate them. And Bobak even keeps um, different bean connectors. He keeps blue and white bean connectors. If you're curious, it's environmental versus no if they have the little schmoo inside of them. But he'll re-terminate them correctly and everything. And even then, a good technician, if you bring out the same person who had done the install, on a very high secure environment, they'll be like, this wire's shorter. I always have like this, I don't, I don't unwind the tape this far, why is this wire shorter? Because we have literally cut wire and taken it away. So that is not, surrep none of those are surreptitious entry. Surreptitious entry is even if someone has training and is specifically looking for evidence, there is no conclusive evidence that you got in. There might be something where they could say, huh, I, I don't know, this lock looks like it's been worn down. More. Like, there's a lot of key usage in this lock. How long has this lock been in place? And it might look weird, like, why does so many keys have been put in this lock? But there's no conclusive evidence that, oh, we were doing a master key escalation attack or something like that. And the last thing Adeline says is, thank you for the wonderful YouTube channel. The idea of the giveaway is very cool. Thank you. I promise. Oh my God. I promise the giveaway is coming soon. Uh, we have so much good shit backing up. And the first, once we, so here's the deal, the giveaway thing. Um, I've had so many times where the giveaway didn't work because someone wouldn't get back to me or even people who emailed me and was like, Hey, you chose my name. And I'm like, yes, I did. Give me a mailing address. Crickets. So, uh, I talked to Bosnian Bill and what he does where there's like a web form and you submit, you know, here's my name, here's my address. And then he can scrape it and remove duplicates. So you can't like register yourself a thousand times. Uh, yes, that's what I'm going to do. And it'll be the only way to be in the drawing is if I have your contact info already and I have your mailing address already. 
And the first giveaway is going to be a doozy. You, y'all going to love it. All right. Keyman says, after I watched one of your demos of an underdoor tool and the blocks against it, I thought of ways to modify the tool so it might still work. And he provides some descriptions. Yeah, so Keyman's descriptions were very cool mm -hmm. about modifying the tool so it could be almost like a finger, like a grabby kind of finger. Um, mm -hmm. So if, if someone was intentionally trying to block the attack, could you still do it? Uh, that's awesome. I love people who don't just take a tool out of the box and be like, well, I got to use it this way because that's how they made it. And in fact, one of the best resources online, uh, someone you know, possibly, if y'all follow me, you might follow Not So Civil Engineer. Uh, he's a great kid. We know him. We've worked with him. Uh, wonderful guy. And he has a whole video about mods he has done to an underdoor tool. In fact, uh, at Red Team Alliance in Virginia, he, he left one of his with us and we cherish it because it's one of his first modified badass ones that does other shit. Cool. So if you, key man want to shoot a video about that, like the mods you have done, uh, please do it, throw it anywhere online. That's awesome. The more information that is out there, the more news of like, here's a way I did this thing. It's backwards, but it works for me. Someone else will take it and run with it. And someone else will take it and run with that. And then I will like use it on a job because it's going to be better than the whatever I've been doing. Cause that's what I told not so civil engineer. I'm like, fuck the old way. This is way better. Cool. Yeah. Hacks. Hacks. <laughs> Uh, several folks had the same question. Austin W., Robin V., Bearded Mike, Adeline T., Garrett C., and Vasu J. Um, all asked variations of the getting into pen testing question. Also, Vasu is a high school student who says, I've been a huge fan of your talks and just who you are as a person. Right on, Vasu. I know, I know the feeling. <laughs> that, is, that is so cool. And I hope it is not a disappointment to you or anyone else um, when I say the how to get into pen testing was covered really heavily in an earlier Q&A. Mm -hmm. So Q&A number two, uh, like around the 45 minute mark, I'm pretty sure, is where I started getting into this. And it was such a long answer that even Q&A number three opens up with more fleshed out details. So there'll be a link down in the doobly-doo of this video if you want to like watch a previous one and not have me blather on about the same thing now. Mm -hmm. I also know there's there's an old saying about getting into uh, to pen testing or just getting into anything and getting help, which is what is it? Ask for money. Oh get God, advice. yeah, you told Ask, me this. Yeah, well, that's because I was busy trying to get venture capital. Ask for money, get advice. Ask for advice, get money. Yeah, yeah. And this can almost pivot towards getting a job. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to like work in this field, reaching out to companies, being like, hey, can I work for you? That it's almost like dating and the shitty bar scene it's almost desperate and companies are like that's great you got a resume we'll keep it on file i mean that's what we do we we genuinely need more people sometimes we keep resumes in a drawer and we try to keep in touch with people but it's the people who come first say hey uh i'm doing this with my career i'm not coming to you yet for a job but i'm thinking about doing this do you have any advice those have historically been the people like not so civil engineer literally it was like i'm at, i'm at this point in my career in school I've worked with these people, but I'm thinking about this. What can, what do you think? And I was like, how far, you're, you're where? Pennsylvania? Come down to Virginia. You should beat us. Mm -hmm. And that's just, it's a weird, it's the way our brains work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ask for advice, get more. Ask for more, people only give you advice. Mm -hmm. Bo R asks, are you planning on doing a basic home security video, given how people are getting freaked out about the future under COVID-19? Or do you have a recommendation? Side note, friends who know I'm a gun guy keep asking me about purchasing firearms. And much like your Mad Men reference, I can only think about how a firearm with training is only maybe one ingredient in a security cocktail. <laughs> this is a yeah, good question. it's a good way of wording it. <laughs> um, and yes, uh, being... You know, the, everyone is panicky right now. What do you do? Are you worried about home security? Uh, again, I'll kind of pitch it back to in the before time. I had this week of videos. It was like a video per day. And I was talking about locks that I particularly like and locks that, I, that we use. So if you want like my lock recommendations, look for the videos where it's like, I think it's called the, the deadbolt I use or my deviance deadbolt or something. And that's, that's fine. It's a perfectly cromulent solution. As far as guns, I'm going to pitch a channel from someone that we both like, and he's not far from us. He is a dewback down, uh, a webfoot. No, he's, um, he's down in Oregon. Uh, Paul Harrell. Webfoot. Yeah. If you don't know Paul Harrell, uh, nice guy, mm -hmm. very soft-spoken voice, very 
right? What I have here today oh, is this that. option because this glass fits my hand better than this one does. <laughs> um, Paul Harrell literally has a video. It's like pandemic gun purchase thoughts. And it's, it's for people who may not know firearms. And he walks through effectiveness versus complexity. And it kind of comes down to possibly a shotgun, possibly, you know, like the easiest shotgun in the world, like a break open double barrel. But you can't really, it's not really a repeating firearm. But you really like it. I'm not going to disagree with him too much. It's get a like a Glock pistol. It's the cheapest, smallest, handiest, easiest, unfuck upable option. But you should watch his whole video. It's maybe 15, 20 minutes, and I know that's a lot of time commitment. But uh, yeah, Paul's a wonderful guy, and his staff, uh, everyone who works with him, he's he is that nice in real life. We can all confirm, and he really nails it out of the park. So if you have people asking you questions about what do I do for them, I'm scared of the covids and the you know, the anarchy. Um, check out Paul Harrell's video. Mm -hmm. I'll link it down in the doobly-doo. I just want to reiterate here that a Webfoot is an Oregonian and a Mossback, Mossback. is a Washingtonian. That's right. I'm getting him broken into this whole Northwest thing. I'm I am not from it. the, the I'm working on it. I'm working on it. All right. <clears throat> here we are. Sisyphus has several good questions. Sisyphus has more than several questions. And this is... This is, this is your mulligan, everybody. Sisyphus took it. If you in future ask this many questions, you will get none of your questions answered. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm feeling charitable, so these are all in here. And take advantage of that. All right. From a CNET article, it's obvious that Congress is endangering our rights, search and seizure, our privacy, and our security. Mm -hmm. The article mentions that people will just move their privacy and security services to other countries. What is the article talking about here? So either one of us would be super equipped to speak to this question. But the idea is if you're worried about Congress weakening encryption and you use, I don't know, Yahoo Mail or something, you might be like, well, Yahoo. You're worried about Congress weakening encryption and you use Yahoo Mail? What is the Unlike Venn diagram on that? Very, there's, no, <laughs> oh, there's no intersection on that Venn diagram. So, all right, yes, Yahoo Mail. No, there's no one's using Yahoo Mail. Does Yahoo exist anymore? <laughs> I don't think so. It does primarily as a statistics and weather provider, as far as I'm aware. It's uh, it's turned into a back end and services company. All right, I thought they had managed to ruin themselves completely. Mm -hmm. But let's say someone is not using Yahoo. Let's say they're using like their ISP gives them you know Comcast.net or Verizon. Dot, you know you have an email from that provider, and you say, mm, well, I don't want the government. No warrant checking my email. I don't want them to weaken encryption, break SSL. I want better mail. So that person might switch to, let's say, Proton Mail. Proton Mail is a pretty respected provider. Uh, most of the people we know who need a little more robust privacy tend to have at least a Proton Mail account on the side where they can say, all right, if you really need to talk to me, like you can email me at my Proton Mail account. And that's because they're not based in the US. So the US can change their laws. But if your mail is hosted in Switzerland, I don't really think the U.S. can do much about that. Which is not part of GDPR. It's not part of the European Union, and they're not subject to GDPR, which means mm -hmm. that they don't have to, ha to retain certain forms of data for preservation orders. And they also uh, have the ability to delete data instead of saving it for the user if the user requests it. So yeah. it's, it's kind of fascinating. Uh, honestly, at this point, I've, I'm moving back from ProtonMail over to Google's Advanced Protection Program, if you want to know the truth. Mm -hmm. um, combine that with a security key and multi-factor authentication, and honestly, for targeted people, Google's APP is probably the best that's out there at this point. Yeah. And that's because Google can't turn your mail over. It's, it's already encrypted. Google can't turn your mail over to USG even if they wanted to, now, as far as I know. if the government changes like the law, who knows what Google's going to do. We'll, mm -hmm. we'll have to watch some warrant canaries and other things like that, but... That's true. That's the idea, though. The, mm -hmm. you know, why deal with the government at all when you can just move your shit offshore? Which, if you want the non-advanced solution, that's... Most of the mm -hmm. sex workers I know have a Proton Mail account. Yeah. Because they don't need to keep track of the tech news the way Tara can and I can. They're just like, this is better, I don't trust the government, mm -hmm. fuck it, I'm outie. If you don't know anything else you need to be doing, use Proton Mail, use Signal, and use Tor. Yeah. Yeah, just update the dual core song. Use Signal, yeah. use Tor, use Proton yeah. Mail. Not bad advice. That's not bad advice. All right. Uh, looking for a good VPN service. Oh, I have opinions oh. on this. Okay, fine. Yes. Have so, opinions. 
again, like now we've got Tor and VPNs, right? Which, by the way, if you haven't seen the Grug Q, his talk, right? Just mm -hmm. think it's alphabetical. It's T comes before V. It's not V before T. Mm -hmm. Use Tor to connect to a VPN. Good move. Use a VPN to connect to Tor. Go to jail, as he says. Mm -hmm. um, that is not the way to do it. But as far as VPNs go, uh, we're just going to, I'd say, really flip it to our friend Yael. Yael Grauer, she wrote mm -hmm. a huge review. I mean, she literally used, yeah. must have been 20 plus VPN services right. over the course of months. And I'll link that down there as well. So they, like... Tunnel the Bear. Yeah, Tunnel Bear. Spoiler, Tunnel Bear. Tunnel Bear. Um, they're fine. They're, they work well. Our friend... They've Drew, published yeah. their security mm -hmm. audits. Yes. That's, that's one of the best standards. Mm -hmm. Do they publish? Um, my buddy Drew, he works with us at Red Team Alliance. His standard is, has a VPN been tested in court? And that's not a bad standard either. So he has his own opinions there. Uh, he's I am Redshift on Twitter, if you want to ask him. But yeah, Tunnel Bear is fine. There's a number of, that are fine. Basically, just don't use any service that advertises itself in other YouTube videos. Like NordVPN and, and shit like that. And just anybody who's advertising at the end of a YouTube video tends to be a trash heap. Okay. I need to refill. Stand you need, by. You need to refill? So where are we? All right. Sisyphus says, I assembled a what would stoner do rifle, but sometimes cases weren't being ejected very far. Yeah. I asked Carl about this. Both of us are a little puzzled. Mostly puzzled by the fact that you described the ammo as Winchester black box. And you said that wasn't performing well, but tool ammo was. What the fuck is Winchester black box? There's Winchester white box. Winchester makes match ammo in a black box, but that's not cheap ammo. That, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, usually it's underpowered ammo is going to result in short stroking or bad ejection or, or just weird shit. Um, I don't know, man. It sounds like the tool is working for you, and that's cheap, so just keep shooting that. Mm. How, I mean, we're like into question eight of 95 from this guy. How do you keep your blades sharp? Knife sharpener. Next. Why isn't there more uproar over Donald Trump's shitty behavior? America's fucking racist as shit. Next. <clears throat> May we have more Irish singing from you. Seriously. Not drunk enough. Yet. <laughs> I want you to sing again, though. You just sing so beautifully. Not drunk enough yet. Okay, fine. I'll, I'll help with that. Of course. Also, A, Carl's hair. B, Ian's hair. C, a combination of both. <laughs> what? <laughs> this, may, this is actually the reason that Sisyphus <laughs> gets the pass. Uh, because this is hands down the best question I've ever been asked. Uh, and the answer is so patently obvious that it shouldn't be a question. The answer is sinistral rifleman's hair. Uh, Ian's beard, Carl's chest hair. You're welcome. Okay. Green Goose. Do you have any strong liking or disliking to the 1911 style of pistol? For me, they have the best look of any pistol. Thank you for your community interaction. You are very welcome. Boomer spotted. Boomer spotted? Yes. The it's... 19. Oh no! I you know 19. Everyone loves to rag on the 1911 now. And how many do we own? A, a, a very non-zero number of them. Um, yes, they are iconic. They are a classic pistol. I love the 1911. It was the mm -hmm. first handgun I ever bought. Uh, I bought a Springfield back when I was like you know what. 22 and i thought springfield armory is still like made by springfield armory but no that was privatized and sold off long ago uh that's why i don't like the xd series of pistols and all the charm has worn away 1911 wonderful i own some original gi ones i own a stainless one um i own the kimber actually like that mm -hmm. i picked up not too long ago and it's a dream uh it was just it was a good deal uh, would i keep buying them infinitely no would I make them? Sure. Like, they're actually not hard to mill compared to a lot of other 80 percenters that you can do for pistols. Uh, so yeah, I'll probably crank a few of them. I have the bits, I have the milling bits and stuff, so at some point in the basement you're going to hear the GG humming along and it's I'll, I'll crank out a few 1911 frames. Uh, at some point though you got to get bored with them because they, they're not, like, what's their purpose? Their purpose is to sit in a drawer uh, and wait for the Doomsday? I don't know. They're not a carry gun. They're too heavy. 
Um, they're not really an ideal anything, like 45. Sure. You know what? I'm going to put a can on one of them because 45 is naturally subsonic. So they're a fun suppressed gun, although that's even more fucking weight in an already heavy pistol. But you see, I'm smiling. I'm not frowning. It's they're they're a fun gun. I like them. That's my answer on the 1911. They'll always be a place in my heart. Like my dad carried one, right? Like he he was in Vietnam, and he was impressed when uh, he was like, "Wow, you shoot that one-handed? That one you really had to hold back." And I was like, "Yeah, you were a skinny kid in the army, though. Like, I got I got some some size on me." <laughs> uh, did you take things apart when you were a kid? Did he take them apart when he was a kid? Yeah. Yeah. All the fucking time. There's, yes. Um, and you're like, you're, you're rolling your eyes like you don't do this shit. Rolling my eyes. I'm rolling my eyes because of the first time I left you in this place when we moved in together. And like, like 16 hours later, I get like a batch of signal messages when I get off the plane to Thailand. And the first thing I see is, don't worry, I can pick up some new drywall tomorrow. This is true. <laughs> I did take a wall apart. And I put it back together. It was very well put back together again, and I barely would have noticed that there hadn't been a wall there. Yes. If she, oh, Tara, and I both took things apart as kids, and frankly, oh yeah. this is this is interesting how mm. over engineered and also how shittily made mm -hmm. products are now. Stuff is badly made. I don't think kids get that experience as easily anymore. Yeah. Because if you take it apart now, it's more likely to break. It's just injection molded crap. The, mm -hmm. the fasteners aren't like visible. Or they're just tab snaps. They're not really fasteners anymore. Mm -hmm. I can remember taking our remote control apart as a kid and being amazed. Right? Yeah, they had screws. Exactly. Yeah, I, yeah, I took those apart too. Yeah. They had the little tiny, the little flat, uh, the little mm -hmm. rounded head screws, mm -hmm. and they were impossible to pick up. You could mm -hmm. never like hold them because they were so rounded that they you just like to drop yeah. them, and they kept dropping head first into the little slot because but you could they see were top like heavy. taking yeah. the you see the traces. You could yeah. actually like press the circuit. I I love when I, I have a distinct memory of the Zenith TV remote. Mm -hmm. that had like four buttons on it you know it was like volume and channel maybe there was a power button and I, I could like press the pads and i could make the remote work even though the circuit board was in my hands with a nine volt battery huh. uh, i don't think kids today can do that as easily and that's a shame mm -hmm. get your get your kids some adafruit stuff oh, by yeah. all means <clears throat> all right what would you recommend for basic tools kit and skill to train on for fire department members mm. Yeah, and, who asked this one? Was this, uh, uh, this Ryan, Ryan D? Yeah. Ryan D asked this. Oh yes, Ben A asked the question about taking things apart when, when you were yeah. a kid. Okay. So Ryan, um, yeah, I, I just gave a talk to a bunch of firefighters, one in person, and then I gave some online uh, because we can't leave our freaking homes now. So firefighters and first responders, it's all about bypassing, obviously. Um, get you a traveler hook. A lot of firefighters modify a carpenter square so much so that there's actually a tool called the sea rat it's made by a, a cat here in seattle hmm. that has like a fold out kind of chopped down carpenter square it has a, a gas shut off and some other you know cutter tools on it but yeah slipped slipping latches all day long i teach firefighters to use under door tools uh that's that's a big thing for first response like emts show up at a hotel there's a suspected uh, non-responsive in a hotel room They've got to get in. The manager is farting around with keys or who the hell knows what. If an EMT can just slip, you know, under the door, bam, there's the guy on the floor, non-responsive, revive him. Um, same thing with firefighters. Firefighters got to clear floors in buildings. Like, imagine there's an alarm in a, in a hotel, and they have to clear that floor. And imagine, like, farting around with a manager or a maid and the key and all this horse shit versus under door tool, clear, clear. Under door tool, clear, clear. Under door tool, clear, clear. Just down the hall. So under door tool, all day long. Um, hmm. And honestly, like like rec sensors, man. Those those request to exit sensors. Learn how to use the can of air. Uh, the guy, um, so he's, uh, the coastal fire, coastal fire training. Uh, yeah, he loves the fact that I, I give him a shout. I think that John and his, his crew, like, again, like they teach firefighters this. We teach firefighters this. Don't, don't do the hard thing. Don't even take out a big metal implement if you can just dump a bunch of, you know, propellant through a door and cause a rec sensor to trip and then the door opens. Why cause property damage? Like, the, the, the irons are great. And you can do a lot of crazy shit with the irons. You can, you know, you can literally, I've seen firefighters lift doors, commercial doors, off their pegs in front of, like, a 7-Eleven and just move the door off the frame 
uh, with just with the iron and the axe, and like, bam, there you go. But uh, yeah, we cover all this. We have a class called Exigent Entry. It was going to be in June, but uh, Corona. Uh, so it's going to be in September now. But if you're a firefighter or something like that, come down to Virginia. We'll teach you all this shit and more. Love to have you. Oh, yeah, get in. Rob W. says, I'm currently in school for cybersecurity. Thanks for inspiration on that. And cool. having a hell of a time in algebra. Just how necessary is algebra in what you or She Hacks Purple does? I don't use a lot of algebra. I'm not going to lie. I can't remember. I mean, like when we made this bookcase, we used algebra. Mm -hmm. But in my professional world, I don't use it as much. I, you do more than me with Plotting and charting and, and flight things, right? Uh, yeah, for you use algebra all day long, every day in um, in piloting. Tyra's a pilot. So, uh, not yet. Almost well, there. Almost right. there. Yeah. That is not student, her. Student pilot. Yes. Uh, so, that, is, yeah. that is a form of pilot. It's a, it's a form of pilot. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, yeah, you use it uh, calculating ground speed from true airspeed with wind, with, you know, wind correction angles, stuff like that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. To read almost any kind of chart to figure out where you're going and, and how far it's Nothing but algebra to be a pilot. Yeah. So algebra is useful. Mm -hmm. um, like super advanced, like linear algebra, uh, that shit can fuck right off. You don't need that. But basic algebra, like solve for X. Well, I mean, linear algebra is going to be important for a lot of things like Markov chains and transforms. If you're doing some of the, the more advanced kinds of cybersecurity where you're predicting human behavior, you need to get some statistics, you're doing network analysis, then you're going to have some of the more advanced kinds of algebra. I'm not nearly that advanced. Okay. She's not wrong. And as like so, as far as whether Tanya uses algebra in her job, mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Could we ask her? Let's ask her. We kind of could, right? Did she? She doesn't live in Ottawa anymore, does she? Um, I think uh, she moved from. Did she, she moved from Ottawa to Victoria, actually. She's That's really just close. like north of here. She's just north of here, yeah. Tanya. Tanya, do you use algebra in your job a lot? Hey, Deviant. Thanks for asking. So. The short answer is no. I n never use algebra in my day-to-day -day work, and I haven't in a very long time. There have been a few exceptions in my career where I was actually writing a math app, because that's what my job dictated, but it's very, very rare. That said, the same types of things that, like the same types of functionality works in your head when you do math as when you write code. And so if you're really bad at math, it could be that you don't have a good teacher. It could be that that specific type of math just doesn't click for you. It could be all sorts of different things that are going on. But the way that math works and the way that coding works is the same types of things in your brain. So if you are really, really good at math, which I am, then you tend to just be really good at coding, which I am. <laughs> I picked both of them up very effortlessly. I won an award in high school for top school mathy stuff. And um, in college, I got, you know, 100% on all my calculus and everything. Everyone wanted to study with me. Uh, and that's great, but then I would never use it. And I honestly didn't even understand I was that good at math until later. That could, because sometimes we don't understand our, our own worth when we're younger. That said though, just because you're not naturally inclined to do something doesn't mean that you might not be totally awesome at doing it if you just really put your mind to it. Um, so I'm actually dyslexic. I'm technically legally considered learning disabled. However, it just means I need to learn in a different way and I just had to learn the way that I can learn. So for me, I found computer science really easy. I found math really easy, but when I wanted to learn to play guitar and I wanted to learn to sing, it was so hard. I am not inclined whatsoever. <laughs> I spent many, many, many hours learning how to play guitar and how to write songs and twice as long learning how to sing and not making it sound bad anymore, being able to sing in key and have it sound good reliably. And then eventually I became a professional musician and I released albums. I'm on Spotify and all the places. So you can be not naturally inclined at something and still end up being totally awesome at it. You just have to work a lot harder. So while for me, math was always really simple and I found programming easy basically immediately, that's great. 
that means it's a lot less effort for me. I'm very lucky to have chosen a career that I'm naturally really good at. It doesn't mean that you can't be awesome at it if you dedicate yourself to it. Like as an adult, I learned how to speak fluent French. I started night school when I was 29, and by the time I was 32, I could pass all the exams. It was so hard. It was at least twice as hard as my entire computer science diploma. <laughs> it was so, so, so difficult because I'm not naturally inclined to languages, and that's actually what dyslexia usually is, is that you have a lot of trouble with language. Or, or that's the result, is that you have a lot of trouble with language. And But it doesn't mean you can't do it. I still did it. It was hard. I flew to France to practice. I did a zillion things to make sure that I could learn this language and I really dedicated myself to it. And you can do it too. I absolutely believe that if you dedicate yourself to something, you can accomplish it. That said, we need way more people working in our field. We need a lot more people working in information security and like in all areas of tech, but especially security. And I'm super biased, but application security, <laughs> we really need you. So do you need to do math every day? No, you don't. If you think math sucks and you don't like it, you will rarely ever need to do it unless you are trying to do contracting and figure out your taxes. Uh, but you do need to be able to think in that way. And if it doesn't come naturally to you, you're going to need to learn it, but you definitely can. I hope this helps, Steve. There you go. There you go. Derek B., a locksmith, says, what is the most improvisational, low-tech, wasn't even sure it would work, but couldn't think of anything else, can't believe I just got away with that juvie skill physical bypass you've ever used? Mine wasn't during testing, but long story short, ended up bypassing a poorly aligned latch with the earpiece of my glasses. Solid. Sold a lot of latch guards and correctly sized strikes to them after that. Hells yeah. <laughs> Upsell that shit. Um, there's a good eyeglass story, actually, when we, we had just gotten the Virginia space. Uh -huh. And we hadn't moved a lot of things into it yet. Mm -hmm. uh, Robert was there. Uh, he was actually there. He was working super late. It was at night. I think he, he like went to walk Envy or something outside. Mm -hmm. Yoga dog. Yeah. And dog. he realized he didn't have, like, you know, he didn't have his key. Mm -hmm. He just went downstairs, took Envy out, and he's like, oh, eat me. And the you know, cover plates over all the doors. And this is before we upgraded the locks, though. So he knew the locks were slippable. And we had this mannequin in the lobby. The, the mannequin with the with the ghillie suit on? No, well, that's the other one. There's the a, there's other a, mannequin in yes. your... Yes. There's the professional lady-looking mannequin. I stopped asking a long and time ago. Yeah, so he took the professional lady's glasses... And he was able to actually travel or hook the door behind the plate with the glasses. So I think that's awesome. Why is there a professional lady? Nope. It's for nope. Nope. Stop. I don't want to know. I don't care. I don't care. It's for a disguise nope. elements class. Oh, it's cool. We All run right. a disguise class. <laughs> um, the, the funniest thing I've ever done was using, it was a hotel. Yeah. And there was a, there were two hotel rooms adjoining. Two people, you know, they, they knew each other. They were all staying together. Somebody had closed the adjoining mm -hmm. door and then... They weren't paying attention to that fact, I guess, because the main, like this hotel, so you got two hotel rooms. This one had the privacy night latch flipped. The, there was like a 12-year-old kid staying with the family, and he went into this room and was hanging out, hanging out. And I don't know why he wound up closing the door, or he wasn't paying attention to it or something, but he then exited this room. Oh. Now, he didn't have a key to this room. His mom didn't have a key. To, they were staying in this room. Okay. Uh, and the kid was very upset. He's like, oh, I can't, I screwed us out of the room. I can't get my, my Xbox is in there. Who the hell knows what oh. he needed? And I was like, well, it's just the night light. You have your room key. He's like, yeah, I tried the room, but look. And he opens the door and the night latch is there. Oh. And I said, well, and I looked down the hall and I was like, all right, walk over here. Okay. The maid, do not disturb sign. And I was like, well, it's, it's got some flexivity to it. Let's flexivity let's try it you know and i just kind of <laughs> place it and i could slam the door a couple times and can i have your room key and i hit it again and i and i just one i just kind of push as hard as i can and the door pops open right. and this this kid looked at me like i was a fucking martian he was like <laughs> how'd you do that and i was like i don't know people pay me for it sometimes you don't have to i say that to you on dates all the time <laughs> Especially when you're breaking into places. Okay. Uh, craft Xbox. Far too many questions to get to all of them, but you chose a sampling or two of them. Yes. I think. Okay. Uh, 
Because Sisyphus already played that card of like, here's a billion questions. So I guess some of your guys are good ones. What did you do before pen testing? Many things. Um, this is a fun question. I like when other YouTubers answer this. Um, Ian and Carl have answered, like Ian used to be a bartender and he used to work, at, I think, at an auto parts store and other things. And he liked machines. And uh, what did I do? I mean, I've been a lot of things. I've been a lifeguard. I have worked in education a lot. That, that's my main jam. I really, I enjoy teaching. I've worked uh, at college level education as a tutor. I've worked at adult education institutions. Mm -hmm. I worked at this sort of when the, the internet was like hot. You know, I, I worked in like web design and I taught people web design and graphic arts. And it was, yeah, I've, I have tripped over backwards into pretty much every opportunity I've ever gotten. Mm. You've worked a lot of fucking more backbreaking shit than I have dealing with the public. Yeah, cocktail waitressing. It taught me more than just about anything else did about how to operate in cybersecurity, I'll tell you that right now. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I've done a lot of stuff. Clean houses, toilets, weeding gardens, raking, waiting yeah, it's tables. All, it's all in her book. You what? can read about it there in the intro. Well, I didn't tell him everything. Some of the, some of the good stuff is, is waiting for 100 years after my death, like Mark Twain. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. This guy had more, right? Uh, yeah, he's got... Uh, ooh, what kind of systems do you see improperly installed most often? Oh, God. Exit. Exit and egress. Really? Um, yes, all the time. All the time. Why? Uh, because so... I mean, You've got to let people out of a building if it's on fire. So. Right, but... So here's an example. If a door... Mm -hmm allows egress without the presentation of a credential. Okay. That's weird in a secure environment. I understand you have to be able to get out. And I'm not even talking, I'm talking about like mechanical egress, not a rec sensor or something, mm -hmm. just mechanical egress. There are secure facilities, data centers and shit, where if I can slip the latch or under door tool the, you know, the Van Duper and panic bar or something, is that that one where if you press in it for 15 seconds, it'll let you out? Well, DTEX makes those. Like a number of people make those. But no, the, these are... But there's You can fuck with those, too. Um, but no, it's literally like the, that should throw an alert. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it doesn't. Hmm. Uh, yeah. A lot, of, a lot of systems that where a door operates almost in passage mode when it shouldn't. So yes, I, I, egress. Egress is... We, we screw with that all the time. And it should always throw an alert, and it doesn't. Is that more like... Is that more like improperly monitoring egress? As opposed In a way. To the, the, locks are, the locks are working fine. It's just nobody cares if they have been uh, triggered by somebody who doesn't have a proper credential. In a way. But, I mean, okay. to me, that's part of being installed wrong. In the okay. configuration is part of the installation. Here, here. I wish more people believe that. Most fun job and most challenging job. I don't answer that question. And, uh, honestly, in many ways, they're the same job. Um, I've told the story before, like, was it Darknet Diaries or somebody who interviewed me? And I, there's this, the, Google, like, my name and Trunk Monkey, you might find it. But. What? Um, <laughs> superlatives. This is a thing I, I've talked about on InRange with Carl and his Q&As and stuff. Um, superlatives are the worst questions. And I'm not trying to fuck with Derek. Is it Derek? Uh, craft Xbox. Sorry. Not trying to fuck with you, man. Um. What's the greatest, best, worstest, biggest, smallest, uh, most deep throatiest thing? Like superlatives hmm. are, at their heart, boring questions, um, because there's always either like a super direct answer or an answer that's just not interesting. Hmm. This happens way more to Carl and Ian, in my opinion, really? where people say, "What's the best rifle for rifles? You know, what's the best rifle for hunting?" And then Carl, best pistol for you know, home defense. Yeah, what's the best, best pistol for okay. home defense? Well, the answer right. is a Glock 19, actually. Wow. But let's see. Then it's a boring question because the answer. Right, right, the the, the really answer is either a... painfully obvious, okay. or dependent on a ton of other considerations. And the the question doesn't really speak in a fun way. See, I, I stole this policy from CGP Gray. Mm -hmm. uh, CGP Gray and in, in his Ask Gray videos won't answer like superlatives. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite country's flag? And he's like, well, that's dumb. And it's Canada, and why? But No, it's not. But, I mean, Canada's got a great flag. Canada's got a good flag. Because it's simple and impactful and not boring. 
Mm-hmm. But um, but it's still it's a boring question. It's I don't wanna, I don't want to fuck with you, man. It's not a boring. It is it is a question that doesn't tell me about you. And I love seeing a little bit of all of you in your questions, a little insight into your lives, and not just me barfing out, well, here's the things that really spin my beanie. You know, Who's like, your favorite wife? Well, came, And your dad. Yeah. Moving on. Came close on a few, but you're the best one. <laughs> of yeah. all of my husbands, you are by far the most recent. Yes. <laughs> I need another fucking drink. <laughs> love you. <laughs> I stole that from The Long Kiss Goodnight, which, by the way, is one of my favorite movies. Okay. Jamie M. says, mm. where do you see the physical pen testing side of things in 10 years? With everything moving to the cloud, do you see the physical side of things becoming obsolete? If I have a company and everything is in the cloud, why would I hire you to break into my physical location when I could just have a guy do everything from his computer? I have opinions on this, but please feel free to, like, Give your opinions. You're your, it's your channel. Go ahead. <laughs> I mean, the cloud is still located somewhere. Mm-hmm. And more and more, our company does data center jobs because the security of the data center is paramount to the security of the cloud. That's kind of, that's a big thing, man. It's not a single point of failure, but it's a big point of failure. If certain very critical infrastructure and, and data centers, that's, that's become a big chunk of what we work on. Mm-hmm. And then in the end is... Like if the office, like sure the data isn't in the office, but the office still has to care about if somebody has a disturbed like partner, an ex or somebody who shows up, they have to care about if they've had a threat and like packages Mm -hmm. are, you know, scanning. There's a lot of weird, disturbing things in the world Mm -hmm. that physical security is always going to be a part of that too. So we, we're going to keep eating for a while. There's a flip side of that question, too. Um, the question is, why would I hire you to break into my physical location when I could do it from a computer? The other side of that is, why would I bother with computers anymore if I could just have somebody walk into the building? And the answer with, why would I, why would I bother with computers is, how do you get into a building? What do you do to get into a building? Literally, any building. You interact with a computer now. You interact with a computer now, or you're using like an Envoy system, or you're talking to a receptionist. And what is the receptionist doing to find out whether or not you're authorized to walk into the building? She's looking at her. Computer. Checking your Active Directory, yeah. right? Like, is this person? Oh, I lost my ID. I'm John Q. Smith. Would you please let me in? I work on the 13th floor. Well, John Q. Smith, your your face matches this picture that has just been updated in right. my database. Good mm-hmm. heavens, heavens to Betsy, you must indeed be John Q. Smith. Proceed, sir. So, yeah, there's, there's a reason. It goes back and forth. Um, yeah. But the answer is physical and digital security are functionally, at this point, the exact same thing. Correct. How do you tell if somebody's walked into your building? You look at your video cameras, which are all stored in an S3 bucket someplace. Don't have it set to a public S3 bucket. Anyway. We found those. Yeah. Haven't we all? I should take a drink because I presumed the secretary was femme presenting, and I said her. Did you? Yeah. What do you take a drink for? That's good. You don't get to have good rye when you make a mistake. No, that was a penalty this. drink. Penalty drink? Penalty drink. That's good rye. It's not a penalty drink. It's the, it looks the same you as a penalty celebratory drink. drink. This drink is, this the is, ros- it's the rosé. From Hedges, though. This is a good release. It's, it's, a, it's a good release, but now you're on camera drinking rosé. Thank you. All right, here we are. <clears throat> Because I'm concerned about my masculinity. Uh, okay. Um, Glenn J says, "Have you seen B and E from A to Z?" He dropped a. Uh, he gave you a YouTube link apparently that will yeah. be. I am not saying the word doobly do. I am not saying it, and I'm not saying vig vig vig. Vigeo. Okay. Is this is this the A V E thing? Isn't it? Yeah. I will drop a link. In the fine description below this lovely filmed entertainment, you will find words written down. This is. Okay, I can't anymore. Down below me in the doobly-doo. Wow. <sighs> there'll be a link to that video. I'm not saying that. And yes, uh, B and E to A to Z. It is, this is, it's a video that looks like it was shot on a VHS cassette camcorder in, you know, 1984. But I actually think it was filmed in like 2002 or something. I don't know. It's, it looks older than it is. And it is a source of both mirth and smiles to a lot of us in the industry. It is genuine material, but it's it's from an era before we all knew how to communicate about this. And it was someone just, you know, he just kind of brain dumps. He's like, here's a bunch of information. And some of it's been in text files, and some of it's been in these weird out-of-print locksmithing books. 
If you've ever seen, like, kind of a shitty black and white scan of an old locksmithing book from the 80s. Ooh, that MIT one? Imagine that oh, yeah. turned into a video. And that's kind of B&E from A to Z. We're in an all two screwdrivers. Work around the parameter, 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock. Pop the uh, cylinder. And a good pro can do it faster than that. Stick a screwdriver in. Unlock it. Open the door. Uh, but it's 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 one of I don't want to I'm not throwing shade. I'm honestly saying it's it's in a it's a moment in time, and all of you and your friends should get together and fill your glasses and watch it one night because it is it's a hoot. And everyone everyone who's ever put something out there on the world that others have used, mm -hmm. the first time they ever did it was probably not great. But you know what? The first time this guy did it, he made money off it. So he's laughing all the way to the bank. All right. Paul S. Here in the UK. Ooh, I'm going to be in the UK soon. Hello. Uh, the majority of doors have a multi-point locking strip down the edge with rollers or hooks engaging in a strip on the frame. And in some cases, also deadbolts top and bottom into the frame. I'm taking these mental notes right mm -hmm. now. All right, you got to keep me up. Yeah, yeah. Go, babe. All right. Are these sorts of doors ever used in the U.S.? And secondly, what is your opinion on them for security? They're wonderful for security, and they're very seldom used in the U.S. Hmm. Uh, multi, they're, they're often referred to as multi-bolt doors. And sometimes this is the, the locking side of the door has multiple dead bolts just sticking out. That's more for cutting resistance than anything else. If someone were to get in there, you'd have to cut bolt and bolt and bolt and bolt. But there are multi-point doors where they actually throw bolts out at all, all four sides. If you're ever curious, this is a fun piece of history. Uh, if you've ever seen very old multi-lock, specifically multi-lock and some other brands of Euro cylinder, where the tail cam doesn't look like your usual, here, I'm a tail cam, but it looks like a little cog gear. Usually it's like a black cog. That is an artifact from way back when multi-lock was the so multi lock was originally Rav Baryach. Rav Baryach was a was an Israeli brand, which means it means multi bolt. So that that cog that gear was engaging with the bolt work on all four sides of the door, and that's the that's a fun little historical, you know, tip. Uh, you don't see that anymore as much, and most of these solutions, they I mean. We talk about this in some of our trainings. A lot of the European doors, and I think maybe the next question or down the road, someone says, uh, uh, it's, you know, are bypass type attacks to these sorts of doors, or are they pretty much bulletproof to that sort of, basically, are, are these vulnerable to bypass attacks? No, they are really not vulnerable to bypassing. Really? And most of these doors, again, they're not made for easy ingress and egress. Mm -hmm. They're made for incredible robustness in the face of potentially bad, bad actors and adversaries. You don't see doors like this in the U.S., and Rob really covers this in, in his security designs class, right? Mm -hmm. Like, the U.S. fundamentally is a nation that's never been conquered. We've never been occupied. Uh, Europe, the Middle East, a lot of parts of the world that have a much more checkered history, they've experienced real occupation where the forces in the street, where the state didn't either have a monopoly on power and force, mm -hmm. or the state actors were the baddies. They were the, like, you know, looking... Tell me more. Vichy What's France. that like? I know, right? <laughs> yeah, well, okay. yeah we, we're getting there. We're getting close. Um, that's so disturbing to say, but yeah, I'm actually happy that our home is not easily breachable with, like, a battering ram. Um, but yeah, the idea of if the police outside the door are there to harm you, your culture develops these much more robust door solutions. And uh, multi-bolt doors are kind of like mm. one of those examples. Mm. There's a whole lot of social commentary we could poke at there, but I, I'm just going to take a sip of this right now and uh, move to Lyle S.'s question. Okay. So Lyle S. says, What is in your and Tara's glasses this evening? You usually start your videos by telling us that, but during this Q&A, you didn't. That is true. Um, so you said you were drinking rosé, is that I correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. The, the Hedges release this year or last year? Uh, it's, um, I think, let me see here. What have I, what have I got? Um, 
It's twenty nineteen. Um, this is the twenty nineteen um, the rosé. There's a really great winery in eastern Washington. Yeah. This, we we drive out to Eastern Washington to hunt, and yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a winery we like to stop at. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we got some of their rosé, which has has been doing us quite proud. I am drinking mostly just rye tonight, mm -hmm. uh, from back in Pennsylvania, where I'm from, is Rittenhouse Rye. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm not doing much special with it. Uh, I'm dropping a little bit of Angostura bitters in there and some ice, because I'm not la fancy this evening. What is that? Two ingredients. It's it's an emergency. Two so ingredients. Like, in it's the well, you know you know what it's I am emergency. dropping one or two drops of sugar alcohol to make it. So the old fashioned was originally made with rye sometimes, not always mm. uh, bourbon, and yeah, sure we'll call this uh, we'll call this an old fashioned in a pinch. How, how the fuck is this guy asking this question? Is, are you from the future? <laughs> what the fuck, man? Now, he's a follow up. He says, <clears throat> "Yes, I am from the future." I was riding in the Baja 1000 off-road race and wound up in the past somehow. Any advice? Jesus, Lyle, I don't know, man. Like, keep your head down, try to stay safe, find a, find a place to hole up. Uh, try not to become your own great-grandfather or something. Mr. Leopold, a government worker, says, Is there any free training out there you can recommend? I paid for my own locksmith basic training, and I use my own personal time off to attend what I can find. Is there anything you can recommend from disaster prep, victim services, to even just ba basic things that you think would be handy? Bonus points if there is anything web-based I can justify while doing at work. Whew. The free is going to be the hard part there, right? Mm -hmm. um, yes, like loads loads of training if you count training being tons of HackerCon videos that are online mm -hmm. the defcon media server like yes jeff has been maintaining that for how many years now i mean mm -hmm. he literally is getting every defcon talk that he has ever had recorded all the way back to super single digit like he's back around defcon 5 with at least audio that's a wealth that is a trove yeah. that's the library of congress of but that's a lot to find anywhere else. dig yeah. through it is. and it's hard to to, to kind of call that mm -hmm. CPEs or justifiable mm -hmm. credits. They'll let you do that for the CISSP, though. Really? Mm -hmm. Even DEF CON talks? Even DEF CON talks. Well, there you go. You can watch them and attest to the fact yeah. that you've watched them. As far as it goes for anything else, for, for free 99... <laughs> free 99? <laughs> you're not going to get pro-grade training, right? You're going to get somebody sort of speaking to a large room that happens to have been recorded. Um, if you want super inexpensive training, what does he say his job is? What, what's, um... He's a government worker, which probably also means there's some conflict of interest stuff too. So it's it's often difficult for gov workers to yeah. to justify or to take stuff. And th there's like there's lines in classes and some trigger stuff that they have to disclose. I will say yeah. this: it's hard to do that. I, I got this because sort of, of coronavirus, yeah. a lot more conferences are trying to go virtual. Obviously, mm -hmm. Black Hat this year. All virtual. Our class is virtual at Black Hat. Um, SANS. SANS has moved. They've been good at virtual for a while now. Mm -hmm. They're moving way more of their courses into virtual. So you're going to have more options probably soon. Uh, they're not going to be free, but maybe they'll be cheaper. I mean, honestly, they're, they're not going to be much cheaper because most of these institutions, if you, you say, hey, it's an online class. I'm not in person. I need savings. And they're going to tell you, well, you didn't just justifiably. Here. Yeah, you are getting a savings. You're not yeah. paying for a flight, a hotel, meals. Like there's your savings. Mm -hmm. So you're still paying the Sands Black Hat rate, which is a substantially non-zero rate. But look for smaller yes. regional cons. Um, in Montana, Big Sky, Big Sky Security, mm -hmm. Cyber, Big Sky Cybersecurity Con. Yeah. Uh, it's run by again, full disclosure, friends of ours, LMG Security. We work with them. We know them. They were planning an event just for the Montana region and COVID. So they wound up making it virtual. It's all on, it's going to be online and all their training is going to be online. Everything's going to be, but mm -hmm. for way less than you're going to pay for Black Hat or Sands. So maybe check mm -hmm. that out. Link down below me in the doobly doo. Oh, he said the word again. Okay. And moving, oh, uh, so Mr. Leopold does also say, thank you so much for all the YouTube videos you post, as well as being great to make sure uh, that a lot of the con talks you do gets posted as well. You are a wealth of amazing information and seem like one of the minority in being a great human being. Yeah. Aww. 
Thank you, yeah. Leopold. You sound like a nice human being, too. Mm. Good luck as a gov worker right now, and especially I know it's hard to find trainings that you're permitted to go to, can get funded. I, I know it's tough, so good luck on that one. And yeah, you're not wrong. He's... Like I could have been, I could have been locked in a house for the last three months with substantially more unpleasant company. <laughs> this is true. We all could be. If any, if any one of you are realizing that your house is like neat and tidy, and mm -hmm. you're not trying to strangle the person you're in the house with, just count your blessings. Mm -hmm. That's not to say I'm not also, you know, taking care of the. That's cool. Antibodies and and, and anti. It's an antibacterial. Uh, antibacterials. Yes, exactly. There we go. Mm. So, all right, next. We're like, we got two more pages, maybe, to go? Oh, yeah, yeah. Something. We're getting there. Monkey on fire. Monkey on fire! Do I have to say that that way? Monkey yeah, it on has fire. three exclamation points. Monkey on fire! There you go. Okay. It's like 12 o'clock at night, and I've had two glasses of rosé. Like, yeah, I'm pretty chill at this point, dude. <laughs> all right. I mean, you know, monkey on fire. Mm -hmm. All right, here we are. I am a programmer, and I am, te I am trying to teach myself how to be an effective pen tester. Any trustworthy sources of good info for not wanting to just throw all my fancy new equipment in the burn barrel and give up? Thumbs up on the burn barrel reference. I grew up on a farm, too. So, if I understand this, Monkey's saying that they are currently mm -hmm. a programmer? Currently a programmer and teaching but themselves... They want to become a pen tester. To be an effective pen tester. And yes. it sounds like they're hitting a wall, maybe? Or they're... Mm -hmm. I, I'm wondering if it's a physical are... pen tester. It's, all, it's frustrating. Let's, you have those big kits of stuff. And let's like, assume it's digital for a minute. Digital? What is What are some of those hack-the-box challenge uh, websites and resources that... Oh, 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 yeah. Okay, so um, if you want to learn, depending on, on if you've got those digital tools, um, I have really been super digging security innovations, um, online CTFs. One of the things that happened as all the conferences went digital is everybody had to start figuring out how to do CTFs online. So one really cool thing that's happened, I'm actually in a CTF right now. I know it doesn't look like it. You know, I've got a... Uh, I stole yeah. her for a little while. Um, so... Uh, you they'll they'll be essentially a cyber range online and you'll get creds to log into it um hammer away at that you will be uh able to find and figure stuff out um honestly when we've got a lot of fancy tools if you just learn like wireshark inside and out you're already going to be so far up on most of the competition metasploits out there already in community edition so the fancy new equipment is good, but this this goes back to like the algebra question again. The the two mm -hmm. plus two and understanding how to do substitution variables and um, just understanding how to attach to a process or modify the values in a cookie is really where a lot of this is based. Is Give the basis us the part. the top two or three yeah. Googleable phrases or mm -hmm. products. Go give me some Google searches. Give me two or three Google searches that'll send them down a path. Uh, so do there's a couple of good of good things out there. Depending if you're a programmer and you're and you're not familiar with a lot of pen test stuff, um, one of the most basic things you can do is start doing some of the tutorials for Metasploit. Um, so like Google Metasploit tutorial. Google Metasploit tutorial. Uh, there's going to be a lot of those out there mm -hmm. as well as con talks on Metasploit yeah. techniques. Georgia Weedman's talks or her book. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, pen uh, Georgia Weedman's um, pen testing book is huge. Mm -hmm. um, I. I didn't know you were going to ask this, but I'll actually note something that I and several other really cool people are doing. Um, Charlotte Woodrow and um, and Ian Meyer um, are working on a project that that we that I had come out last year called the Nerd List. Mm -hmm. If you've never done anything like uh, like crack a hash before for a password, this is this is so basic. It's it's barely even hacking at this point when it comes to talking to people who are dealing with data breaches. Like you. People should have this this one figured out, but it's a great entry point into pen testing just to figure out how to crack a hash. You're going to want to use the tool John the Ripper for that, and that's available just about everybody, uh, just about everywhere. Yeah, a lot of the fancy tools incorporate them as you as you see fit into a lab or VM wherever you've got it. Um, only after you understand them, the fancy new tools are only as good as your understanding of them. And if you really understand John the Ripper. Wireshark, maybe Hydra, um, yeah, and Metasploit, you're going to start understanding what's happening in pen testing. So, yeah, right. and find those online CTFs too. Security Innovation is a really good one. Uh, what is uh, captureTheFlag.online 
is another location that has online cyber ranges, and they've got some free stuff mm -hmm. out there, too. There's a lot of good resources out Name there. Name your top favorite yeah. people to follow on Twitter who are really welcoming to people getting into this. I'm going to say Ian Meyer. And then you, oh, yeah. I'm going to steal that one. You totally go talk to Ian Meyer. Um, there's a gentleman um, who's on Twitter, and um, I, I will make him put it in the text-based description below the fine filmed entertainment. I'm not. Doobly do of the nope. Vajayo. Um, it's a gentleman named Abachi, and he's posted really incredible OSCP guides. Um, and I'm a super big admirer of his. So he'll, he's got some really great stuff. It's You'd call that more intermediate level, but it will be instructional on um, all the search terms you'll need to find stuff. Yeah. Right on. Mm -hmm. That was like the longest answer to date. How, how are we doing here? How many, how many more uh, pages we got? Well, you didn't tell me that you were going to have No, that was fucking question. baller. That was... So, I didn't have the no. chance to make it. I, yeah, I, I apologize for the length of this letter, but I fear I did not have enough time to make it brief. Anyway. <clears throat> How are we doing? Where, where are we here? We're on Tammy. Tammy right. asks, if you had nothing much to fix for dinner, what could you come up with on a whim? My hubby is a retired chef. Sweet. Uh, now he is a welder. This, this guy sounds hot. Okay. And it always amazes me to watch him make something incredible out of nothing much. Isn't that cool? Uh, so, oh, yeah. So answer that one first, and then she's got some more. So, or they never want to presume. That's all right. Mm -hmm. I think she uses she her in her okay. in her email. But okay. um, yes. So, if we don't know what we want to do for dinner, mm -hmm. um, and I think this is related to the next question. Somebody else asked a very similar question on the next page. We'll get to it. I tried to group the cooking questions together. Tara once described the idea of fridge Velcro to me, and it's a really good idea. So the idea of looking into your fridge and saying, eh, what do I got? Like the lazy version in the, in the 70s and 80s was casserole, right? Mm -hmm. In fact, I'll quote some sort of like comedian I saw when I, I was a kid at some club. And he was like, ketchup, cheese, potato chips, casserole. Like that's how <laughs> mom, mom doesn't want to cook. But it's a, you know... <laughs> But that's, again, like, there are a number... If you don't live in the Midwest, um, and you don't have fried onions that you can just sprinkle over everything, and you don't want to make a batch of bars... Like, I can just drop mid, Upper Midwest references all fucking night long. What's a batch of bars? Well, they're they're not cookies, because they're bars. Because what? they're better. We have to make bars later. Why are we, what's in a bar? It's Is... like a cookie, but it's better. Just... Okay, fine. Everyone from Minnesota right now, if your house hasn't fucking burned down, you're, you're thumbs upping my comment. Oh, wow. So, but no, the idea of fridge Velcro the is... The world is just shit, but... Is being able to bars. look at... <laughs> by the way, so the short answer is fucking eggs. Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. if, if you're not a vegan, just have eggs in your goddamn fridge. Because you can do so much shit with eggs. Mm -hmm. Eggs have showed up on this channel before. And the mm -hmm. eggs on cocotte, the fucking the way we scramble eggs. Like, there's a lot of goddamn shit we do with eggs. Um, what If I already took eggs, this is like family feud. Like, I'm like, <gasps> eggs. Oh, and that's dang. the top answer. How are you not going to prepare me for this kind what's of thing? The, what's another fridge Velcro item that, that you look to and you're like, I'm going to make this happen? Uh, good Greek yogurt. It can do anything. It can be sour cream, it can go into soups, it can be breakfast. She's not lying. Be, it can be dessert if you just sprinkle like a little fruit over the mm -hmm. of it. It can be a delicious um, salad. It goes. You can dollop a bit of it on just about anything and it yeah. makes it salad. Like you can have a tomato and you can put a little bit of Greek yogurt on top of it and then like sprinkle some like dried parsley on it. Lo, it is a salad. Mm -hmm. You can put, you know, lemons and, yes. and olive oil and whatever the hell else you want to on it and it works amazingly. Then you can thin it down. You can turn it into like lossy mm -hmm. if you want to with cumin. There's nothing you can't do with yogurt, and it is an incredible ingredient as well as being high protein. God, so. marry me every day, all the time. Oh. Mm hmm. Yeah. So there you go. Fridge Velcro is is the yeah. answer to that. Fridge Velcro is the answer to that. And it sounds like her husband mm -hmm. may know that because she says he was a chef and. Yes. What else do we have? Any more? For oh, us? oh, yeah, uh, we, what, do. What, what we, we do. We do. We do. Uh, good. Um, what was your most fun job? You don't have to give out any secrets, but I love your sense of humor. Also would love to see a group video, even if you had to disguise them or use a speakerphone. Love your channel. Oof, we got the superlative question again. Um, most. He has a um, most fun job and he won't answer, but he's got a most fun job. No, the most fun job was the, the crazy data center where the trunk monkey story happened. And that was your one, other Q&A, right? 
one of these days, we will have the whole core group team, mm -hmm. the entire Red Mesa team. We'll have Glasser. Mm -hmm. We'll have freaking Sophie. Like we're gonna get we, we. It was a it was a big goddamn job. Like it was. Hmm. Everyone likes to pretend that their pen tests can last for weeks, and that on a digital pen test, that means sometime during this three week period, we will attack the server. No, this was like us on the ground for weeks because there was recon and there was like, dude, Dr Robert and Drew like army crawled through fucking fields of animal shit in this nowheresville in the American South just to put eyes on this government institution. Like, there's a whole bunch of shit to this story. I flew there, actually, to, yes. to visit you for just a couple yeah, of days. because I was gone for so long. And I walked in, and I was like, there's, like, wiring that they've hung in this, like, location that they're in. And yeah, we had a field office that we made field office. in an there's Airbnb. Like, we rented... Like radio equipment. I was like, why do you have 17 yeah. radios, and why are they all labeled, like, not you? Yeah. <laughs> what is happening we here? We rented at a giant house <laughs> yeah. that was maybe three miles from the Target. And we were able to radio. We like we set up mm -hmm. a freaking J pole, and we're like talking to them in the field, and we're mod we had like a you had radio equipment. Like pro you had a proper station there. That the reason it's the most fun job. It was you know like Ocean's you Eleven. You did all the stuff. You did everything you could do in Ocean's yeah. Eleven when you got Don Cheadle, and he's like monitoring mm -hmm. the job from you know the whatever hotel suite was the HQ. Mm -hmm. We the house this little Airbnb house mm -hmm. was like our HQ. And we were turning over new product each night. We were we were mm -hmm. modifying our our IDs each night. We had updating our stories. We're going to the store. We're going. We're printing, you know, silk screen on helmets. If I'm gonna show up mm -hmm. as a fake inspector for this air conditioning system, mm -hmm. and we just threw everything at the wall and saw what's what would stick, and like it all stuck. And it was so it was so valuable. And also the biggest thing, the client was super into the after action. Mm -hmm. um, most people, the way a job works is like at the end of all right, you demonstrate impact and you fuck right off, like because you got to get to the next job. This client allowed extra time, mm -hmm. and we all stayed on site. We sat down, like we literally debriefed their whole security department mm -hmm. the day after we burn shit down and we're like here's everything that you did great here's where you had a problem it's all fresh in everyone's mind and that that was there was some emotional work mm -hmm. because some of the security team like they were on shift when we were actively fucking it's with hard. their radios and yeah. stuff and they were like, that was all. We were like, no, that's okay. This is what we did. Now, when you did this, who was the first guy to take out their phone? Who called somebody on a cell phone? Mm -hmm. And somebody raised their hand. We're like, that's incredible. Mm -hmm. Because you pivoted. And that's why you started shutting our shit down. Because you, you were calling. You were literally, the group texting, like, hey, radios aren't working. Mm -hmm. I'm in the SOC. Like, message me now. And, like, this one guy just took initiative and, like, bam. Mm -hmm. And that, like, so there was, everyone was rubbing their wounds while at the same time learning. Mm -hmm. That was the best job I've ever done. I'm going to say, I'll, I'll say something that I've, I've noticed about you in that job, actually. Um, most of the time, respectfully, most of the time, I mean, you, you always come loaded for bear to every job. Um, but Not with firearms, just so we're clear. It's a metaphor. Like, I, I have to be clear, apparently, on your channel that I'm using a metaphor when I say loaded for bear. Anyway, um, you... It's, it's often so easy for you because you're good at what you do. It's so easy mm -hmm. for you a lot of the time. This is one of the very few times I think I've seen you use all your skills. You had to use everything you were to pull off the job, and you yeah. did it all. All the skills, the disguise, the surveillance, the everything, the mm -hmm. funny, the humor, the, the radio skills, the cop skills, the hacking, the yeah. every bit of it. And like, it was a balancing act. It was right yeah. when... All of the things we had learned mm -hmm. were like a wave washing on the beach with experience. Yeah. We, we didn't have, like, some of us had never bluffed our way mm -hmm. that boldly before. Some of us had never, 
I, I don't think I had installed um, mm -hmm. certain bypasses on electronic access controls the way I did mm -hmm. on that job. But if anyone, this is, wow, you're going to see how old I am right here. Paintball. Paintball or airsoft nowadays, I guess. Old. Paintball's awesome. When you play those <laughs> games, when you play Milsim kind of paintball bullshit, go big or go home, right? Like, fortune favors the bold. And you learn that. Like, in the field, aggression occupies territory, and, like, that's how you win the stage. Yeah. Um, every pen test that I've ever had that I've really loved has been being in that vein. Mm. Uh, go fucking big. Just like get out of the car, march right up to that giant secured gate, and there's like a guard shack here. And you're like, hey, just got to check a thing. And you're like fucking taking a card reader off the wall, and you know, you're punching like an ESP key, and you're, you're fucking with like, hey, can you, uh, I'm not going to walk in. I'm not going to walk in. Can you press the button? And like, boop, boop. Like, okay, now wait. Was that 10 seconds or 50? How long was that dwell? You put the reader back on the wall, and you're like, Pre press it again. Boop. Boop. Like, all right, I don't know. That might that might have been 10. I'm going to have to check with somebody. i gotta, I got to call Frank. Excuse me. <laughs> if, I can get, if I can get back in the car. Like, who there's, fucking cares? There's, there's a fairly decent shot of there being a Frank someplace. Yes. I mean, all right. And, but, yeah, just, oh, my God, go big. Go big, and you don't have to go home. Yeah. Because going big, and, I love and you guys' emotional yeah. literacy on that on that job. I watched you guys for a couple of days, mm -hmm. and it was wonderful to watch you work as a team and be so yeah. careful and thoughtful. It's I've I've said this before to a couple of people that it's always surprising to me to see you guys that you're just such serious badasses, but you're all like, how's your how is your how's your feelings today? How's your family? Mm -hmm. Is everything okay? How are you feeling emotionally supported? And I was like, this is amazing watching you guys work. Well, together. everyone was away from yeah. home for a long time and everyone was like you're out of your comfort zone mm -hmm. as my theater people would say go to your dangerous place right like we're we're doing weird things that's supposed to make you're you're lying to people you're supposed to feel uncomfortable about it mm -hmm. and then it works and then you're uncomfortable with how fucking easy it was and how good it feels to succeed at it yeah i got you all right all right uh, oh, Tammy says, if you ever come to Ohio, I will make you some venison pizza. Even the people don't that don't like venison go back for seconds, seconds or thirds. Is it venison backstrap? Because I'm there. I will fly to Ohio for that. You can't buy it in the U.S. You got to oh. The I'm gonna say that we both like venison. Yup. Mm -hmm. And you can judge from me that I will come back for fourths. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> All right. Who we got? G3 Yost asks, what is a food tip or trick that you wish more normies and food illiterate people knew? Thanks for everything you have taught us all. Stay safe in there. Uh -huh. Stay safe in there. Oh, yeah, I, know, oh I get it. Quarantine. Okay. <laughs> I know. I, I caught that. I was like, ah. Oh, uh. um, what is a food trick? <sighs> Learn when to fuck with food. I always want to fuck with food when Stop I'm cooking. Stop fucking with food. She doesn't ever want to fuck alone. with food. If you've got good food, you do the bare minimum thing you can possibly do to it and leave it alone. Let time do the work for you. That is the truth. Don't don't fuck with food. Yeah. Um, I, I used to always feel like I had to be doing something to food. Like used mushrooms. To. Great idea. Like Because, you know, mushrooms, they look fucking big and dry, but in fact they're not. They have to mm. give up their water. And I was like, oh, I got to stir and do, do every Turn poke, and poke at him. No, just fucking throw a, three tablespoons of butter in the goddamn pan. Throw the Four mushrooms one, in. one, all I'm saying. Good Lord. Three. Fine, whatever. A little salt mm -hmm. and just let the mushrooms just be for what? Like 20 minutes sometimes. I mean, like, shake the pan a little bit. Toss them maybe twice. That sounds like fucking with food. I don't know. Yeah, but Are you, you on my side poke, of the coin? You're going to poke at those mushrooms. You're going to turn them into gush. They're going to be gray, sloppy grossness. They're going to be good for nothing but cream of mushrooms. Much like too. flying, if you will, mm -hmm. less is more. Mm -hmm. Wait, what? Overcorrection, too much action on the stick. Ah, don't overfly the plane. Got it. Yeah. Okay, cool. Less is more with food. Mm -hmm. Mick asks, if I ever meet you in person, would you object to it if I were to count you, call you Count Olaf? 
I find myself doing so in my head when watching your videos and would like to know if I should nip myself or nip this in the bud now. Thanks. Well, now I'm going to call him Count Olaf every single chance I get when I look at him. You can always tell me that. Spike. Hey, Deviant. How's it going? Stocked up with enough scotch, I hope. Yes. <laughs> Where do you see the future of physical security going? Despite all of the technical advances, such as IoT, and I know you discussed this before with IoT causing alert fatigue, oh yeah, in many ways I don't see a lot of practical innovation, and especially not much that is adopted even if it does exist. Do you think that artificial intelligence might be able to cut through things like alert fatigue and perhaps even identify common attack factors in physical security the same way AI does with virtual security? I guess what I'm asking now that I think about it is, do you think robots are, not today, but someday, going to take your gerb? <laughs> they took your gerbs. They take your gerbs. Okay. Um, I mean, like, fuck, I hope so. Uh. I, I hope that, because, again, like, the population is just getting bigger. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be more facilities and infrastructure, more buildings. So hopefully, uh, technology aids in some of this shit. Mm -hmm. The big thing, and does this tie in with the next question? I don't recall. Uh, it sort of does, actually. Andrew F. Uh, says, I hope you and those close to you are staying healthy. Thank you for taking the time to answer our questions. And also for the emergency cocktail, Andrew likes basil, Hayden's, and rum. Uh, what new technology or technologies do you think will have the biggest impact or cause the biggest disruption in the security space? Offensive, defensive, mm -hmm. what are you going to do about it? And he says he appreciates the time you take to do this, and he always gets a lot out of your videos and talks. Thank and I'll you. save his last question to the end, but yes, Spike and Andrew are asking. Spike and Andrew, you're both speaking in, in the mm -hmm. same space, and this is this is the thing, right? It is something that I fundamentally hate. But I see it as the future of interior security. Now, here's the... All right. Interior. Hmm. All right. Here's where we're going with this. And there's a, there's a whole Star Trek Next Gen thing that I I'm want in. you to talk about. Ready? Let's do it. Make it we, so. We engage. Love Continue. 24th century Star Trek. That, that's the era when all the cool shit that you can analyze. Mm -hmm. Okay. Facial recognition. Mm. It's all facial recognition this is all right first of all so we're all on the same page this is happening now there are buildings right now in silicon valley mm -hmm. where if you try to walk around the building like you got in a side door or like somebody let you in who the fuck knows in a minute or two the sock is getting like mad alerts like who is this they don't belong here. Now, all of these AI firms that are working in this space are giant trash heaps. Every one of these goddamn firms. The fact is, this is the future. And this is one of the times I have a hard time suspending my disbelief when I watch Next Gen or... DS9 or Voyager. DS9 is an interesting environment, right? But like, well, half the technology on the station is Cardassian, right? But if you're on an end, if you're on a Notably, fucking Federation starship, Cardassians had higher body temperature, which meant that much of the infrared technology, facial recognition, would have been built on that would have utilized infrared technology in order to not work right. Would not work properly. If you are on a Federation mm -hmm. starship, mm -hmm. the idea of like, oh, where did this person go? It's the 24th century. That, it, it's thrown out the window. Captain, a shuttle has just unexpectedly and unauthorizedly launched. Oh, my God. There's, a, there's a whole great what? article about that why, the reason why <laughs> shuttles can be stolen so easily. Yeah. There's, there's an in-universe explanation. There's an out-of-universe explanation. Mm -hmm. Anyway, facial rec. Um, facial rec mm -hmm. and other biometrics, that's where it's all going to go. Eventually. It's not there yet. It's going to get there. It's going to get there in our lifetimes. And it's actually going to be incredibly scary. Mm -hmm. um, private property, private property going to private, right? Like the shit they're going to do is pretty wrong. And I'm not 
actually opposed to certain legislation reining in even what you can do with biometrics and facials on a private property. But the same firms that are doing this, if, if you have one firm mm -hmm. who is doing facial recognition shit for the top 75 companies in the Bay Area, well, they're secretly building a database that they're selling to the police in, mm -hmm. in San Francisco and Oakland and everything else. Like, mm -hmm. we need, we really need every one of you who's my libertarian friends, and you're going to wave the fucking blue and gold and the black Literally and gold. anybody. It's not just libertarian. You're going to tell me, oh, leave, leave the fucking, leave that defenseless corporation alone. They are doing evil mm -hmm. shit, and it's going to be used to put the boot of the state on your neck. We need to regulate facial recognition and other, broaden the, what, what's the most broadest term? Bi, bio recognition, we'll call it. Uh, There's gate analysis. I would, There's. I would call it identity. Um, I uh, probably ident um, identity and access management. So, and mm -hmm. it's it's the the technology that identity and access management is at least partially going to be based on in the future. Mm -hmm. um, when you walk into a building, it, interestingly, in the first couple of minutes of the J.J. Abrams TV show Alias, in 2002, you had. Um, Sydney Bristow getting facially recognized to walk into, what is it, Credit Dauphine? I know too much about early 2000s, fabulous. That's the show was doing for Gardner? Garner. Garner. Garner, yeah. All right, she doesn't plant carrots. Okay, not what? a gardener. She probably planted carrots if she wanted okay. to. I don't know. Didn't uh, she date Ben Affleck? She married Ben Affleck. Is she still married to Ben Affleck? I don't think so. Okay. Bad flick. Anyway. Okay. So, so yes. Stepping aside from that. It's going to be identity a, management mm -hmm. in a weird, really dystopian, fucked up way. Mm -hmm. And it's going to first happen in offices. Mm -hmm. Then it's going to move to sort of co-op, high-rise, multi-million dollar condos in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. And it's going to grow from there unless we put legislation in place that doesn't allow it. Which private entities will ignore, but public spaces are ostensibly beholden to certain kinds of regulatory framework. And that's where you need to be following what the EFF and ACLU are mm. doing uh, in this space. So, oh, last question from Andrew F. Gin oh. cocktails? Yes. Vesper. Yes. Vesper martini. Yes. I'll make one. <clears throat> Travis W. Share something that a lot of people probably don't know about you. Jeez. I, you know how people joke online? They either overestimate or underestimate how much they sleep. Mm -hmm. I legit, no thumb on the scale, sleep about nine and a half hours a night. He's not joking. I'm there. Yeah. For like six and a half hours of it. I tend to go to bed around two in the morning. <laughs> And I pretty much get up on an early day. I get up at 10. Usually I get up, like, honestly, get out of bed. Close, One, you know, close two to o'clock in the afternoon. I mean, I'm awake. I'm reading and I'm like responding to emails. But yeah, I sleep about nine and a half hours a night. Huh. Johnny, no fucks over here. I don't care. No fucks to give. All right, we're not going to get him off the table, He's so fine. that's that's Frankie. Say that's hello. Frankie. All right. Bonus question. What is the story behind the name Deviant Olaf, and why the Olaf pronunciation? Which, by the way, actually is related to the next question. Oscar K. from Iceland and Matt S., probably not from Iceland, uh, asked the same question. What's the origin of your name? And also, uh, one person says, keep up the good work. Your de-escalation videos have helped him immensely. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, Olaf. Uh, O-L-L-A-M is pronounced Olaf. And if you wonder why, um, you could say it's actually originally spelled O-L-L-A-M-H. And when you say that doesn't help, that's because you don't know anything about uh, Gaelic, apparently. Gaelic and Irish Gaelic uh, are languages where the pronunciation, like, holy shit, did you, who has watched fucking Lady Bird? Yeah. Or like if you movies of Mikey, if you watch Film Joy, like you know you know Sir Ronan, right? Mm -hmm. 
if you look at her name, Saoirse Ronan is not spelled the way you expect. Saoirse means freedom in Irish Gaelic. But yes, the, the Gaelic tongue is quite the rich tapestry of pronunciation, and an MH is essentially a V, V sound. It's anglicized many times as, a, as just a V. So O-L-L-A-V would kind of be the Anglican spelling of Olaf. Uh, but yes, the, the Olaf is a, it is a Celtic term that basically refers to a wandering teacher, mm -hmm. uh, someone who has learned many of the oral histories, but not all of the oral histories from all the towns and all the villages and all the provinces. Uh, Olaf's wandered oh, around the, the, the land and they sang for their supper. They, they taught people various things. <laughs> the camera. It's all good. <laughs> I got him. <laughs> uh, yeah, Olaf's were basically peripatetic professors. And that is what I aspire to be all the time. Irish Maybe. Gaelic, the only language where diphthongs have exponents. Yes. <laughs> okay. Facts. Facts. Albert T. says, uh, I hope this email finds you and yours in good health, especially in these corona times. I was wondering if That's you would far. like to muse a bit on the use of stereotypes in general and mm. gender roles in specific in social engineering and physical pen testing. Do you use any stereotypes? Do you train for it? Tim K. asks a very similar question where he says, on physical security jobs, do you ever fake a physical disability as a way to socially engineer your way into places you're not allowed? Good questions. God, this is, they're really good. They're really good questions. Um, and it's tricky, right? It, it almost makes me remember that South Park episode where Cartman pretended to be special needs to qualify in the, you know, the Special Olympics. In, in a nutshell, no, we've never done that. We've never um, pretended, like, we've never used a wheelchair. We've never... Go ahead. Sophie's wearing the pregnancy belly. Ah, so... I don't. I don't view pregnancy as a disability, even if an HR, even if an HR department would say so. Oh yeah, I didn't say it was, but um, that is yes. definitely we just have, expressing a physical need that you don't yes. have. So we have the the broader way of describing it is we have tugged on heartstrings. Yes, we have done mm -hmm. that, and being social engineers, and I would say. If you're not following someone like Jack Hyde, if you're mm -hmm. not following Rachel Toback, mm -hmm. um, both very, very femme presenting people who recognize that that is a certain privilege, right? Like people find women, femme, femme presenting people to be more disarming. They both feel less threatened and they want to help them more. And those, those individuals are going to leverage that. Um, it's tricky though. It really is like the idea mm -hmm. of every time you leverage something that isn't your space to be in, is there a chance mm -hmm. you're devaluing it and fucking it up from someone who needs something and a legit accessibility need. If I fuck with a mm -hmm. man trap, because by the way, do you know, like man trap, you know, the, the fricking, one person at a time, badge in, mm. badge out, all that bullshit. Every man trap you've ever seen in some video. Do you understand? There's a pedestrian access door. Mm -hmm. Floor to ceiling, 36 inches wide, single badge. It's next to the man, man trap. trap. Hmm. Because someone in a goddamn... Like someone in a wheelchair, someone can't in a wheelchair, get into you can't get in a goddamn man trap. Mm -hmm. That door is there. Now, if I and my colleagues were to fucking leverage that, because mm -hmm. it's it's way easier to fuck with that, is that going to cause extra scrutiny and headache for someone who is differently abled in the future? That's something we have to talk about. We have to be really mindful of. And you um, also have to talk about the fact that not testing it might enable somebody with nefarious motives to break yeah. in the exact same way and not prepare the cards for it. These are, like, again, I, mm -hmm. there's going to be someone who's, like, already queuing up some all-caps typing on Reddit 
because I'm talking about this this much. But these are conversations that my team and I have Mm -hmm. on every job, like late at night with many bottles of wine. And we're like, do we do it? Do we not? Like Mm -hmm. you have to, I'm not saying there's one right answer, but you have to be mindful of it every time. Mm -hmm. At least you talk about it. I mean, ideally we should all talk about it. Tip asks, are you involved with ham and amateur radio at all, or do you see any benefits from learning about it? I am not directly involved. Um, You have a ham license. I don't. Mm -hmm. And yes, I see a million benefits. Uh, RF is robust. Mm -hmm. It is a protocol with repeaters. They're all over the country. There's TCP over RF, Mm -hmm. right? Like, There's a whole interesting thing about whether or not uh, transmitting packets over RF is considered encryption, even if it's plain text, because it's not in uh, the the official language of the country, which we don't actually have an official language. But if it's not in English, if it's mm-hmm. if you're transmitting something that could not be read as Morse code, there's a question as to whether or not it's appropriate to use it. You're officially not supposed to yeah. use ham band or, or amateur uh-huh. radio for encrypted the communications. communications. Mm-hmm. Loads of people do. Oh, yeah. Loads of people do. Um, and the, the whole thing, like... I do not know of what you are speaking. It Yes. You don't have to do that shit until mm-hmm. society crumbles. But if mm-hmm. society crumbles and all of a sudden you and all of your mutual aid people mm-hmm. flip, you roll over to some sort of encrypted protocol, FCC isn't isn't driving around mm-hmm. trying to find your Jeep broadcasting Hard Harry's broadcast. Yeah. Like, you know... And they're not going to notice a three-foot metal pole stuck to the top of your condo anyway if you're running a repeater of some kind or another. Right. All right. Matt S. asks... Can you comment on the plausibility of opening maglock doors with a taser? E.g., the first three minutes of Electro Boom's video. Okay, so this door uses these keypads to unlock. The guy has a taser you can buy off Amazon. <laughs> he zaps the keypad and the door opens. Simple as that. Unlocked? What is this garbage? <laughs> it seems like every single door he's zapping is opening. Where is this place, actually? What? Yes, so Electro Boom has this crazy video where he is actually showing another video from Russia. Uh, yes, so what you have here, they, they look like a weird one-wire sort of token, like almost like a Salto I-button kind of authentication machine. Uh, yes, it, the idea of using, and again, it's not a taser, it's not an axon, well, unless you got drive stun. It is some sort of electronic shock device that they are zapping this very kludgy, old, weird Russian access control box. And they all look to be, if you watch the video, it looks like they're all the same brand of box. It looks like they're getting into a lot of doors. Now, I actually don't think this is fake. This look, you know, it has the look of sort of like a TikTok, Reddit, get the clicks, get the karma kind of video. I think this is real. Hmm. And I think there is some bad shielding and bad grounding. And I think what you're seeing is potentially, I, I don't like to I, to imagine that they're destroying a bunch of doors and security. They may be just melting certain relays and reed switches. Like, you you can melt a reed switch if you throw enough voltage in it. It'll just jam, it'll just melt fucking closed. If it melts closed, does that do anybody any good? Uh, well, it does good for the guy trying to get in, but I don't think it does anyone else good in the building because now their door is permanently open. So if the if this if this um, if you melt this particular connection then the ability to lock the door goes away, not the ability to possibly, unlock it. Okay. Possibly. All right. Um, so, yes. Have I seen exploits like this? Yes. Do I imagine this one brand might be super vulnerable? Yes. This look. This looks legit. If you live in Western Europe or in, you know, North America, do I think you're worried? No, you shouldn't be. Hmm. Okay. Kinkajou asks, Hey, Dave, I hope you, Tara, families, and associates are well. Before I ask a question, I wanted to let you know I finally got a job. You got a job! Woo! 
I appreciate all the wisdom you've imparted both from the previous Q&A and from the deluge of videos. They seriously were one of the things that helped keep me sane. But to my question, toilet paper, over, under, or don't use a TP holder, and no cop-outs with bidet. I am so happy that someone like Kinkajou, who, those who don't know, like, Kinkajou's super active. Um, they're always chiming on the comments. Like, mm -hmm. Kinkajou's been around. If, if you watch the videos for a while, you know Kinkajou. Mm. I've read, I recognize that yeah. name, actually. From I love that someone with this much connection to all of us and the channel could ask such a non-expected question. Um, yes, by the way, just we're going to, with whatever's left in our glass... Congratulations. Congrats. Yeah, nice job. You deserve all of it. As far as toilet paper goes, as you know, we have cats in the house. So for that reason, I am also a big fan of the underhanded roll. Mm -hmm. For some reason, you're not as much. I don't know why. Occasionally, I will witness a toilet paper roll that has been installed fresh in my bathroom, and it is not the right way. I don't fuck with your bathroom. You want to do it wrong, you do it wrong. Actually, no. So here's, here's the thing. Ready? I'm going to own this. I hang my toilet paper the wrong way. And as much like Ian says when he shoots rifles, Ian's like, I'm wrong-handed. Yes, I am left-handed. And not only that, I hang my toilet paper fucking underhand. Because A, gatitos cannot <laughs> fuck with it. And also, if you're pulling the paper... You can do the, the one arm pinch. You do the one arm pinch and you yank. You can, there's a breaking action you can use with your hand. You can't do that the other way, it doesn't work. You try to pull and you, cause then you yank and then it comes on this way and you get a fucking how you get are a you bunch this, of paper on the floor. How are you this manually dexterous and you're bad at taking toilet paper off a roll? Literally just grab the top no, I'm sheet great or at two it. and go rip it off the top. It doesn't spin. Rip it off the Sideways. Top. Stop indicating that you want to create that rolling motion. Just do it entirely sideways. So, you sound like someone who works for Saran Wrap. Saran so, any... Wrap? Every one of you doing this, doing this in the kitchen. Oh, I'm going to take my saran wrap and you fucking play this game it's for 18 years. Perforated. It's a fucking mess. It's perforated. No, no. How are you bad at tearing a perforated piece of paper you away from it. a different piece of perforated paper? <laughs> in the kitchen, the proper is pull it out and do with that no. number. You get that shit at Costco. In the bathroom, it's pull, break, yank. <laughs> My channel, I love, my Q&A, I am right. I love that you have a specific set of steps that you execute on with toilet paper. Yes, he's this obsessed. I have a procedure. Everything. A right, procedure fine. for everything in my life. And we're on to the good question, Kinkajou. And again, seriously, congratulations. Um, last question. Cyber stranger. Is it stranger or stanger? Looks like stanger. Are you sure? You could be Cyber Stranger, but you're not a stranger. No stranger danger. You're Cyber Stanger. Stanger. That's Cyber Stanger. That sounds like a drink we do invent, basically, at, like, DEF CON. Oh, my God. Can yeah. we invent the Cyber Stanger? The Cyber Stanger? That's kind of cool. Okay. <clears throat> I've been struggling to find my thing. It might, be, it might seem silly, but I believe this is a problem a lot of other kids in my generation are having. Maybe this Cyber Stanger is slightly too young to drink. Anyway. <clears throat> like how your thing is breaking and entering and lockpicking lawyers thing is lockpicking uh, a broad or specific subject that drives you crazy, makes you lose sleep just by the pure desire to study it. Destin from smarter every day. Oh, I know that guy mm -hmm. uh, on YouTube. Like I don't know. Um, says that to find your thing, everyone starts by imitating someone they admire. That is awesome and true. Mm -hmm. I admire you all and have been trying to imitate you, albeit on a budget. Just out of curiosity, I would like to know how you found your thing, the point where you realized that this is what you wanted to do for your life. That's a great question. This is a marvelous I don't know question. the answer to that question. And I think that's why I ended it this way, mm. because none of us really knows the answer. So, mm. first of all, I want to take a minute. Someone wrote to me once, mm -hmm. and they th their question was basically, it was an email, and they're like, hey, so I'm almost out of high school and I'm at that point where I have mm -hmm. to decide what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. What? So 
I really think this thing. And I, I, my whole answer was like, whoa. whoa. Get that. She, whoever told you that, like, tell Aunt Mabel to fucking go smoke on the back porch at Thanksgiving and not pour mm -hmm. more of that shit in your head. Because anybody mm. who thinks that they have to decide on one thing to do ever in their life. Mm -hmm. No. I didn't get to this career by wanting this career. Mm -hmm. I tripped over backwards into this career. And honestly, how? there's going to be a time, I mean, how? Because I worked in computer network security and I only did that because I worked in network design and computer repair at the same time. And I only did that because I thought I was gonna be an engineer and I was bored with engineering classes and I took comp sci and I was like, well, code is stupid. I'm not going to use Fortran. So this <laughs> I'm fucking drop out of college. This is bullshit. <laughs> every stage of my life has been a fuck up. And every stage of your life has been not a fuck up because you're... It's been a fuck up. No, I mean, you're you're more willful than I, but... <laughs> a deliberate was, fuck up then. <laughs> All right. There was... The, the, the email I got that was like, yeah. hey, well, I'm at that point where I'm about to decide what I'm going to do. Mm hmm I'm having visions of like Dustin Hoffman in The Graduate. Oh when, my God. When he's like, what am I, plastics, son. Plastics, the future's in plastics. Oh my God. Like, no, that, that doesn't exist. The idea of I'm leaving school so I have to decide what I'm going to do, that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And it's a very different skill set of how you develop yourself and how you work in a way that is lucrative mm -hmm. and rewarding but allows you to pivot mm -hmm. it's <sighs> start by making sure that you can put a roof over your head then ask yourself what you do and don't like about your current mm -hmm. job this isn't like you decide at one point it, i'm sorry no do... this is you're okay. way better at this than me <laughs> this isn't like you i tell people to talk to her for career advice not me <laughs> because again like i'm a fucking derpy white dude who is privileged and i tripped over opportunities uh, so this is, this is the hard part, right? Like everybody trips over opportunities, but this is a different, I'm drinking your rye right now. I'm answering the question. Take I, a sip. Mm. Give me the glass. So yes, dearest, uh, the, you don't end up deciding at the age of 18. God, I would be so screwed if I'd try to decide at the age of 18, what I wanted to do for a living. You mm. figure out what you do and don't like about your current situation. And then you go for 40% better on your next job. It's much, much, much more about figuring out quickly, about rapidly prototyping your career than anything else. Um, if you've got a job and it's digital marketing or small engine diagnostics in a mechanic shop, or you are running inventory for a small restaurant chain, like all those jobs are different and interesting and they'll have fun things in them. You'll be on the phone when you're running, you know, the, the inventory for the restaurant chain and you're talking to the, the vineyard in France and you realize all of a sudden that you want to be somebody who spends more time doing that, maybe buying wine there. You're, you're doing small engine diagnostics and you realize that what you actually want to be doing is designing the, the aerodynamics or hydrodynamics for race cars. Like these things are things that you can do eventually. It just takes you a long time to get there and you have to, to step your way there. It's not magical and there's not, this is not waterfall. It's agile. If that makes any sense, you're never you're never able to aim for a point 10, 10 years away and get there. You're just aiming to make sure that three weeks from now you got 80% done what you thought you were going to get done. And then you try to make it a little bit better next time. That's all. The short answer. The short uh, answer. Well, Go. <laughs> Wait, I'm, I'm keeping this while you short answer. Everyone you've ever respected mm -hmm. has never gotten to where they thought they were going to be. <laughs> And they've always just sort of found a path. Yeah. It's finding and seizing opportunities. Mikey Newman, the the um, the movies with Mikey channel, he started to include this like smash edit cut thing. No, no one, one knows, knows what, what they're, they're doing. I love that because yes. it's so true. We don't know no what we're doing. No one knows what they're doing. Yeah, you're going to not know what you're doing. And that's either fun or terrifying. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, it's both. If you go with 80% fun and 20% terrifying, then you have enough fear to make you move forward and enough fun to make you love your life. Right there. 
Yeah. You don't you don't ever have to feel like you're doing it right. Um, be just pick your values more than your goals. Stay true to your values, and as long as that happens, you'll feel a lot better when you're fucking our age. Our age, cradle robber. We has a old. <laughs> <laughs> I has an old. He's sitting right here. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> so yes, um, we'll do this again. We're gonna try to do it once a quarter. Mm-hmm. I'm not nearly as good <laughs> as Carl and Ian and so many other channels uh, that do the the, the monthly Q and A, but this was really great, and I appreciate every one of you. I love you. I I hope that everyone's staying safe. Um, I hope that no one has experienced great health risk in your yeah. families. Please wear a mask. It's not because of your health. It's for the health of others. Mm-hmm. Please just be kind to one another. Be a little soft and a little easygoing until we all get through this because we're going to get through this. And no matter how shitty everything feels, all of our history, at least Western history, has been a process of the slow boring of hard boards and earning more rights and more privilege and more mm-hmm. more everything for the people that need it. Mm-hmm. You are wiser than me in this. Do you have anything else to say? You don't know how much work he does getting ready for this and figuring out the kind answer to questions. All right. We'll see you all later. He's really this cool in real life. Be kind to one another. Support trans creators. Yeah. Black Lives Matter.